Pujo, te no vemos que toco. Bana quit ni go, Pujo que chanto a tem, que cagi wat sonig a ming and doing je, the chi by metel and gisagi buzz. Apache, and ji can dump pijayan on my slewa tooth are king, a squamish are king, little wat are king. Apache, and me go to Riago go away, Bakan and Nishna beg a beer wat on my otenang. Kibujo and a nim minawa and the kit. So there you have it. The key to success for progressive causes all across the land. <laughs> any, any questions? <laughs> I always like to start in Ojibwe. It's the language that I grew up with. And uh, you know, I like to acknowledge my uh, ancestors that way and introduce myself the way that uh, they taught me. But also just to, to expose people to what my language sounds like. You know, th this was actually the lingua franca of Canada, the trade language of Canada for the first 200 years after contact. So if you came here in the 17th, 18th centuries, you didn't necessarily need to know French or English. You needed to know an indigenous language. Right? So just share that with you as your, uh, hey, food for thought of the day. So the big message that I wanted to, uh, you know, talk about here today in terms of engaging people who aren't always those that turn out, is uh, authenticity. Be authentic. That's the big message. Be authentic. And to paraphrase an old joke, be authentic. Once you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> right? The MPP MLAs laughed harder than anyone else at that one because they, <laughs> they know it's true. You know, I... Um, Got involved in politics uh, in January of this year for the first time. Um, I was hiking in the Hollywood Hills in LA, drinking $9 cold pressed juice. And I thought, what could be better than this? Hey, I know, I'll go run for the NDP in this provincial election that everyone has already written off. <laughs> and uh, it turned out it was pretty awesome times, so it was a good choice. <laughs> but, um, you know, on a more uh, realistic level, on a, on a more uh, serious level, you know, uh, there is an issue that was running through my mind uh, throughout the campaign uh, that I, you know, talked to the former Premier's ear off, his Chief of Staff, everybody in our campaign, talked about it on the doorstep num a number of times. And it is one of the things that I hope to be able to... Uh, address in my time in the political world. And it has to do with the systemic racism still faced by First Nations people in this country. And we could talk about the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal decision, we could talk about the clarifications, we could talk about Jordan's principle, but rather than talking about it in the abstract, I want to talk about it in the personal, first person perspective. Okay. So the book that I wrote is the story of my father's uh, journey to reconciliation from growing up in a beautiful traditional community, being taken away to residential school, the trauma that he endured, and then finally, years later, the reconciliation within our family and the personal healing that he found after reconciling with uh, the Catholic Church in a traditional adoption ceremony, adopting the Archbishop of Winnipeg as his brother. And so the book that I wrote, you know, really has my uh, late father as the hero. And all of this took place in the last year of his life, 2012. In uh, the early months of that year, he was given a terminal diagnosis of cancer, pancreatic cancer, very aggressive. My heart goes out to you if uh, you know, you've uh, watched a loved one go on that journey. Living in Manitoba, you know, and this is a great NDP policy, um, every single person in Manitoba is entitled to coverage for the cancer drugs that they need. It's a great progressive legacy that the NDP left. Every single person in Manitoba can get the cancer drugs that they need, except, as we discovered in 2012, First Nations people. My father was living in Winnipeg, not on the reserve, in Winnipeg at the time. Had he been a Manitoban of any other background the chemo drugs that he needed would have been covered by the provincial government. But because he was a First Nations man, he was rejected 
for coverage. I don't share that with you to, you know, ask what might have been. My family has resources. We had options. We could have paid for it ourselves. Instead, he made a quality of life decision. He wanted to have better quality of life now, even if that meant shorter runway in the future. Right? So I don't point the finger as to what led to his demise. But I raise that in front of you here today to ask why it is in 2016, in this country, First Nations people still have to ask whether or not their lives might be different if they were born somewhere else or to a different community. That's not a rhetorical question. I'm still waiting for the answer. <laughs> I have yet to hear a compelling one. No one can form a compelling argument for why First Nations children endure grinding poverty, systemic inequality in the funding for education, child welfare services, or in the case of my late father, when First Nations people of all ages encounter different health outcomes. What we get, or what passes for debate in this country on that, on that issue, when it's brought up, is not an answer to how we tolerate inequity, but rather, yeah, but well, what about the crooked chiefs, right? Which, by the way, Maybe 3% of First Nations have issues with financial management, but that's for another time. So that story has been blown out of proportion. So in the course of the campaign, this is something that I talked to people about. Before I decided to run, I told the former premier, he was premier at the time, I said, this has to be addressed. Put it in the platform. We're going to solve this. We're going to fix this. And so I did a you know, press conference with him one day. Um, to respond to some, you know, attacks that were happening during the, the campaign. And leading up to the press conference, uh, his aide came up to me and handed me the, the form. It says, here, here's your lines in case um, somebody in the media asks you about, you know, your dad and the cancer thing. And then I read it, and it's like, you know, boilerplate political speak. It's like, you know, well, we acknowledge that there have been some problems in the rollout of cancer care and oral drug coverage in Manitoba. Those have been fixed, and now everybody should be able to get the care they need. I grabbed it and threw it back at him and said, this is BS. Right? Except I literally said what BS stands for. <laughs> right? And he's like, whoa, okay. So I'm not going to say that. And uh, I said to the premier, I said, you know, that's not right. And he said, yeah, you're right, that is BS. It's Jordan's principle, we got to address this, right? And uh, it's moments like that that I think politicians, people in the public eye, people in civil society need to uh, guide themselves by. Like, I'm not here to prop up the status quo. I didn't get involved in politics, you know, so that I can bite my tongue for 10 years and then a decade down the road be able to achieve some marginal victory. All right? Like, this is the progressive left. If we don't stake out that ground, who is going to push for a better tomorrow on the environment, for indigenous people, on income inequality? If we talk ourselves out of our own ambition, who will stand up for the next generation, for the future of this country? Right? And so it was important for me to be authentic, even if that mean, meant during the campaign, you know, going counter to some of, uh, you know, the party wisdom and the party uh, message. And it occurred uh, in a conversation about the environment, too. And it's germane to what I was asked to speak about here today because it actually led to people coming out and volunteering in the campaign. So I was asked how I felt about the Energy East pipeline in a debate, point blank, right? And the conservatives and liberals there, they're like, you know, dancing around the issue, not answering. And I'm thinking in my head, like, all the message track that I've been given from the campaign, like, you know, this, well, good jobs and green future and this and that. And they're like, what do you think, Wop? I'm against it, <laughs> right? And I'm against it because I grew up on Lake of the Woods, right, which is traversed by the, uh, tra the existing Trans-Canada natural gas pipeline. And so I have a cultural issue, right? 
because the sanctity of the lake that connects me to thousands of generations into the past and connects me forward to my sons and to generations in perpetuity in the future is threatened by Energy East. But I also don't agree with it on an economic level. Like, I don't see why at a time when we're trying to transition away from a carbon economy that we're investing billions of dollars in you know, fossil fuel transportation. Okay? <laughs> Easier said than done. Obviously, you know, I'm in the party that where labor played a, a, a huge founding role and still has a strong presence, right? And so I can't just say no energy east, right? I also have to come up with a credible alternative for what are we going to do, particularly for the skilled trades, right? What would that mean in the province here? I know people are like cringing in the party probably, like we don't want to talk pipelines again after what happened in the last campaign. But well, you should, right? You absolutely should. And so what's the credible alternative? Well, it's probably not Site C, right? Because First Nations in the area seem to have withdrawn their consent, but perhaps there's another hydroelectric project on the horizon that you could pursue in areas where consent might be obtained. Just spitballing here. I don't know. <laughs> but it was funny, after I you know, just did the unthinkable for a rookie candidate, and that was speak freely, I had young volunteers, you know, of all backgrounds, come out and knock on doors and do drops and work the phones. University age people. And I was talking to one of them one day, I was like, you know, Mitchell, thank you so much. I really appreciate all this hard work that you're doing, the canvassing, this and that. And he said, well, it's really important to me that we do something about climate change. And the fact that you were adamant and clear about how you stand on this pipeline that will cross our province is the reason that I'm here helping you. Right? And so be authentic. You know, it's kind of a tautology. If you can't be yourself and say the things that you want and get elected, you're probably not the right person for the job, right? It's that simple. Another group that I was able to uh, connect with the young people from my own community, the indigenous community, specifically the Anishinaabe community. And, uh, you know, I was blessed to be able to work with a lot of good people over the years in the university environment and, you know, activist community and just the general, you know, cultural community at large. And uh, as a result, was able to get, you know, a lot of volunteers, you know, to come out and help me uh, canvassing and on the campaign. But one weekend in particular was really awesome because we had this one group of high school kids. They're not even old enough to vote. Right? They're like 16, 17 years old, pretty much straight off the res. And they came into Fort Rouge, where, you know, is my seat now. And for those who don't know, Fort Rouge is like, it's this amazing constituency. It's got like all the cool, trendy restaurants on one street and all the cool, trendy bars on another street. The east side of the riding is social housing. The west side of the riding is like some of the biggest mansions in uh, the province. So it's diverse in every meaning of the word, socioeconomically, culturally, age-wise, educationally. And uh, so we're on the west side, like the more well-to-do, well-heeled side, and we got these kids like straight off the res. And you know, some people might be like, oh, Winnipeg, I don't, how are the native kids going to be treated by these you know, upper-class folks? But people were awesome on the doorstep. You know? Well, not awesome, it was a super tough election. <laughs> you know, <laughs> But people's indigenous identity was not an issue. Their youth was not an issue. People were engaging with them as with any other person who would have canvassed on my behalf. And it was really cool to see. It's kind of odd to see too, right? Like some old dude answers the door and he's like giving the gears to this young <laughs> teenager. Why did Selinger raise the PST, you know? <laughs> it's like, like it's, you know. When you think about it, there's like this older non-native gentleman mad at another older non-native gentleman giving grief to this young First Nations youth who just kind of showed up just to get their high school credits, right? Like, it's kind of a funny scene. But it was good because at the end of the day, you know, we were talking and, you know, I was asking them, I was 
video recording their answers, and, you know, what they thought about it, and they, you know, they enjoyed it. They said, yeah, I'm going to canvas again, you know, canvas in a, another campaign in the future, and yeah, I'm going to vote, right? And this was the same, you know, organizer who connected me with this, these young people who organized the Rock the Indigenous Vote campaign during the uh, 2015 federal election, right? And so it's really important because in many communities, democracy doesn't have a ton of intersection with their lives, to be quite honest. Right? And so it takes a real effort to make democracy a habit in a community like mine. Right? But once the switch is hit, then you can see some really special things happening, some really exciting things. And so I'm very hopeful at what can be achieved in this country with greater engagement from young Indigenous people, young First Nations people, Inuit, Métis, greater engagement by people of color, you know, greater recognition of the role the LGBTQ community uh, plays in our democracy. And so I'm very excited and filled with hope for all these things. And the other point, too, is it's not just a utilitarian construct, right? Like, we're not working with these people because we want them to turn out and vote for us, right? We're working with these people because working with them in and of itself has an, in, an intrinsic good, right? Because those kids couldn't even vote for me. They were too young, right? But it's still awesome to work with them, and it was still a rewarding experience. And, uh, you know, we, we, we shared that video that we made with them on social media and, you know, got some shares and some views and all that. And um, one of the ways that I was really able to counteract um, a lot of the conservative and liberal uh, attacks that were leveled at me during the campaign was by using my social media presence. And in particular, creating videos of my wife and myself or with these youth and other situations like that, talking about the issues, but not, you know, necessarily in a policy-driven way, but just talking about it in a kind of a more conversational, humane way, talking about our relationship, you know, talking about family leading into a discussion of child welfare, talking about what it was like to grow up on the reserve, and then launching into a discussion about health care or poverty, things like that. And, uh, you know, I don't want to undermine the valid uh, policy points that are made here, but for many voters, it's not even going to be about the policy on, say, housing. They're going to make a voting decision based on do they think this leader or that leader is more relatable in terms of confronting the housing issues that they have, be it affordability, lack of social housing, or what have you. Right? And so it's important to understand that. And people, subconsciously or not, or consciously, you know, have a nose for authenticity. And nowhere is that more apparent than on uh, social media, I think. Because nobody wants to follow a politician who's just like tweeting out press releases and, you know, has like a boring profile picture. Right? Like people want to get a sense for who you are. People want to see some personality. People want to get a sense that they know the real you. So we did all that. We engaged with folks on social media. We engaged with young indigenous folks. We engaged with students. We engaged with people of all uh, walks of life. And the interesting thing was, because one of the big challenges for the NDP in the Manitoba election this year was motivating our own base to turn out. The interesting thing that I found was, the more we energized young people, the more we energized indigenous folks, the more we energized all these you know, different groups, student movement, the more the base came out too, because they liked that. It felt like they were part of the movement. It felt like there was something special happening, right? And so even those that you may have already counted as your supporters will become energized, right? Party or NGO campaigns. And so we got the outcome we wanted, uh, not provincially. Uh, we, that was kind of a weird uh, night. But we got the outcome we wanted at the constituency level, right? We won Fort Rouge and it had one of the um, better pluralities in terms of any of the NDP seats that were, that were hung on to. So it was kind of an odd night, you know, at the election night because, you know, I wanted to celebrate, but then obviously many colleagues uh, had lost uh, their seats and other people, political staffers, uh, knew 
uh, what uh, fate was in store for them. But a few weeks later, we had the swearing-in ceremony. And the swearing-in ceremony was really special. Uh, obviously, first time MLA, it was nice to be able to uh, take office, uh, legally speaking. But why it was important for me in another respect was because me and my sister, Nahani Fontaine, who is another uh, First Nations uh, person elected, we swore our oaths on our traditional pipes. All right, so the traditional, yeah. So the traditional uh, pipe is how we pray to the creator, right? Like we have a recorded history as Anishinaabe people, but we don't venerate the re recordings of that history. What we venerate is the sacred item, the pipe that we use while we're praying to the creator. And so we swore our oaths holding the pipe rather than a Bible or a Quran or one of the other ways that you could swear it. And when it was my turn, I swore my oath in Ojibwe. And I did it wearing the war bonnet, the headdress that I'd been given in a Sundance ceremony when I was a young man, wearing traditional regalia, beaded vest, moccasins. When Nahani swore her oath, she did it wearing the white buckskin of her traditional regalia. When I looked out and I saw my kids there and some of their friends and saw some of the First Nations uh, young people in attendance, I thought, you know what, that's awesome. This is why I did this thing here, this campaign, right? I almost feel like this was the whole point of it right now. Because for these young people, this is their normal. This is their baseline. All of us, we're compromised. Right? We're already internalizing and have internalized these attitudes about privilege and class and gender and sexuality and indigeneity and what that means for people's different capabilities and potentialities. But for these young people, of course, an elected official speaks Ojibwe and wears a headdress and swears the oath on a pipe. Right? And so that is going to engage people in a whole new way for the next generation. Because immediately after I looked past my kids and noticed them watching me, I looked beyond and saw all the non-native kids in the room and realized that that's their baseline too. That's their normal also. Right? And so when you think about things in that perspective, that is how we are going to engage people in the long term, right? We do these things in the short term to get people out to canvas, to make the policy decisions that we know that can intervene and make their lives better. But also by having people from other backgrounds, other walks of life enter into the corridors of power to take up space, to reclaim space, we inspire a whole nother generation to come next. And to me, that's a win. That's a victory. And so when you think about it in that perspective, it almost doesn't matter who wins the election, right? Because that's a win in and of itself. But then on another level, it totally matters <laughs> who wins the next election. So let's get out there and win an election.